Hi, this is Dr. Katie Bailey, and today we're going to be doing a brief review of imaging of the cella. Our objectives, a brief review of the contents of the cella, overview of common pathologies and their imaging findings on MRI, and the algorithm for deciding where a lesion of the cella is occurring in order to get your differential diagnosis. For normal cellar anatomy, you have the gland itself, which should measure less than one centimeter. The posterior aspect of the pituitary gland is intrinsically hyperintense on T1-weighted imaging. We call that the posterior pituitary bright spot. Pregnant women are allowed to have a larger gland, but in non-pregnant women, the gland itself should be less than one centimeter. The gland does enhance. It is outside that blood-brain barrier, as does the pituitary stalk or infundibulum, and that should measure approximately two to five millimeters, but it should taper. It should be widest at the top and narrowest as it inserts onto the gland itself. In the paracellar region, you have the optic apparatus, supracellar. You have the hypothalamus, also in that supracellar region. Posteriorly, you have the brainstem. Laterally, you have the cavernous sinuses. The most common reason for an abnormal appearance of the pituitary gland is a convex contour, and it's because you have medially positioned cavernous ICAs. Imagine a balloon being smushed on the sides. The top of it gets rounder, and that's what you'll see with a convex pituitary gland. So that's the first thing I look for, those medially positioned cavernous ICAs. You'll see this commonly. We call it an empty cella. It's where the cella is expanded and full of CSF. You can either see pituitary tissue flattened along the bottom of the cella, or sometimes it's so thin that you don't see it at all. The pituitary stalk is still present, but on T2-weighted images, it is full of hyperintense T2 signal material corresponding to CSF with that pituitary infundibulum running through the middle. Here it is on the coronal. There's that optic chiasm. There's the pituitary infundibulum, and then there's that thin band of pituitary tissue along the bottom of the cella. Pituitary cysts are also relatively common. They tend to be intrinsically hyperintense on T2, so you will find that on the axial T2 weighted images on a routine brain MRI. Hypointense on T1, sometimes matching CSF. Uh, a Rathke's cleft cyst can actually be intrinsically hyperintense on T1 due to proteinaceous material, but that would still be considered a cyst. And post contrast is, does not enhance. You have normal enhancing gland around it. It can be difficult to determine if something is a pars intermedia cyst versus a Rathke cleft cyst unless it's intrinsically hyperintense on T1. So I tend to include both on my differential. The pars intermedia needs to be in the midline of the gland, like near the insertion and hyperintense on T2. But again, a Rathke's cleft cyst can look exactly the same. So I tend to include both. Cystic microadenomas are rare. More commonly, you'll see them if you have somebody with a prolactinoma being treated with bromocryptine. When that micro or macro adenoma, that is a prolactin producing one, uh, is treated, it turns cystic and it involutes. The typical microadenoma is described as a hypoenhancing lesion, so you really need contrast to be able to find one. So here's the coronal T1 pre contrast. You see pretty homogeneous signal of the gland. Post contrast, you should have uniform enhancement, but oh, you have this hypoenhancing lesion in the left cella measuring less than one centimeter. We call that a microadenoma. A little trick that you can use if you think there might be a microadenoma and you're not sure is to look at the pituitary infundibulum. Wherever there's a pathology in the gland itself, it's replacing the normal tissue. So you'll see deviation of that stalk to one side of midline. So you'll see in this one, because there's a left microadenoma, that stalk is a little bit deviated to the right as it's in, at its insertion. As it gets bigger, the stalk deviates even more. A pituitary macroadenoma measures greater than one centimeter. It usually has this snowband or waist-like appearance as the mass is growing through the tuberculum cellae. The important thing of the macroadenoma is that, again, it has to measure greater than one centimeter. And then you describe it by, is there mass effect on the adjacent structures? In this case, the optic apparatus is completely displaced superiorly. And you can even see stretching of the optic chiasm and optic nerves because of the mass. There's mass effect superior to the mass, 
and you look for cavernous sinus invasion. To say there's cavernous sinus invasion, you have to see mass greater than 270 degrees around the circumference of the cavernous internal carotid artery. That is when you can suggest cavernous sinus invasion. So here's the mass. It goes all the way around. So that's greater than 270 degrees. That's when you can suggest cavernous sinus invasion. Less than 270 degrees, it can be abutting the dura of the cavernous sinus, but not necessarily invading. Other lesions you can get in the pituitary gland itself. You can have metastases. There's plenty of blood flow to that pituitary gland and to the infundibulum. Most commonly, you see it from lung cancer and breast cancer. This case was actually a small cell that was metastatic to the hypothalamus, the pituitary infundibulum, and the gland itself. You can get pituitary apoplexy. Most commonly, this is hemorrhage into a pre-existing macroadenoma. I'm sure in medical school you remember hearing about Sheehan syndrome, which is pituitary necrosis in third trimester or postpartum women. But more commonly, you see hemorrhage. So these are intrinsically hyperintense on T1 and some areas of low signal within an expanded gland. So you usually find apoplexy as hemorrhage within a pre-existing macroadenoma. You can also get paracellar meningiomas that can grow into the cella itself. Then you're going to look for a dural-based mass that's pretty homogeneously enhancing. It can be in the midline. It can be off to one side. But notice that lovely dural tail sign to tell you that this is a dural-based mass rather than an intrinsic cellar mass. The special case is autoimmune hypophysitis. This occurs in patients who are being treated with ipilimumab for stage 4 malignant metastatic melanoma. What you'll see is a very subtle finding. Pre-ipilimumab, you'll have the gland being of a normal size and some homogeneous enhancement. When patients present with the panhypopituitarism while getting treated, you'll see a subtle change in the gland. It'll get larger it'll be more brightly enhancing, and in some cases, it's actually more heterogeneously enhancing. And you can see that infundibulum is thickened because it is being displaced superiorly as well. So to diagnose autoimmune hypophysitis, you really need imaging prior to starting the ipilimumab so that you can see that subtle change in the enhancement and contour of the pituitary gland itself. A disease process involving the infundibulum, think of lymphocytic hypophysitis. So in this case, you see there is thickening and heterogeneous enhancement of the infundibulum itself rather than the pituitary gland. Here it is thickened and enhancing throughout its course. And this is a case of lymphocytic hypophysitis. A pituitacytoma is a relatively rare a benign mass that presents in men in their sixth decade. What you'll see is an area of nodularity along the pituitary infundibulum that matches the signal of the pituitary gland. Uh, in some cases it can enhance, in this case it did, it did not, but it is along the pituitary stalk, it is well circumscribed, it matches the signal of the gland itself on the pre-contrast images. When you follow these over time, they never change. So you need it in the correct patient population and you really need those imaging characteristics to be able to call a pituitacytoma. You can get metastatic disease to the infundibulum as well as the pituitary gland itself. In this case, this was proven metastatic esophageal cancer. So you see irregular heterogeneous enhancement filling the cella, extending into that supracellar region. You can't even see the gland or the stalk itself. This was metastatic esophageal cancer to the cella. Now you can have other lesions in the paracellar region. You can get aneurysms of that cavernous ICA or really any parts of the supraclinoid ICA can project into that area. You'd like to see that nice onioning appearance on the T2 weighted images. You can get an epidermoid in the paracellar region that extends into the cella. You'd like to see that lesion being hyper intense on T2 with areas of restricted diffusion. You can get an osseous mass involving the petrous apex or that petroclival ligament. This case was a chondrosarcoma, showing the bubbly hyperintense T2 signal with the heterogeneous enhancement in the expected location of that petrous apex.
Or you can get cute vascular variants that look funky on MRI, but you can see what it is on CT. Here was a PCOM projecting into that cella and actually touching the top of the pituitary gland. In general, lesions that you will look for in the pituitary gland itself would be an adenoma, either micro or macro, pituitary cysts, you get hemorrhage, that apoplexy. I did not include images of craniopharyngioma because in adults they tend to look like macro adenomas. In kids, they tend to be much more heterogeneous with areas of cystic change, with calcification. They're very distinctive and very irregular, but this one I'm limiting to adults. In the pituitary stalk, you can get hypophysitis, including lymphocytic hypophysitis, which I showed. You can get Langerhans cell histiocytosis, especially in children. It can present with a lesion, enhancing lesion of the pituitary stalk. Sarcoidosis can affect the cellar region, specifically the pituitary stalk, and a pituocytoma. Involving both, think of something more systemic. You can get METs, you can get hypophysitis, you can get sarcoidosis. In the paracellar region, don't forget the things that are not related to the gland. You get meningiomas because there's dura there. You can get ICA aneurysms, cavernous sinus masses, osseous or cartilaginous masses involving the clivus or petroclival region. Thanks to everyone for tuning in for this video about imaging of the cella, learning a little bit about adenomas and other things that occur in that region. Be sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel so you get notifications. Thanks for tuning in.